Bible. We all know what it is, but where did it come from? Christians say it's the inspired word or the word of God. But as we look at the history, the evidence points to quite the contrary. So if you're a Christian, this is a historical look at your Bible, the cornerstone of your faith. But when you see the history, it could shake your faith to its core. Thanks for joining me, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very special episode. I think I say that in every episode, but whatever. So when I said in the teaser that the history of the Bible should shake a Christian's faith to the core, I didn't mean that in an aggressive way, but rather a challenge to think about where the stuff you believe actually came from. After all, this is blasphemy with love. And since I love each and every one of you, even the hardcore Christians, I would hate for any of you to feel as though you're being tricked. So having said that, as a means of avoiding trickery on the show, I've used predominantly Christian resources to examine the history of the Bible. So if you're watching at thebenerwinshow.com, as always, those sources are linked up for you to take a look at yourself. So let's begin at the beginning, shall we? In 443 BCE, we begin with the Hebrew manuscripts. Side note, if you don't know, we don't use the before Christ slash after death labels anymore because our universities wanted to be politically correct. So now we just call these time periods before the common era and then the common era. I know it's splitting hairs, but anyway, the, the Hebrew manuscripts form the basis for the Old Testament as we know it today. But not only are there a ton of them, it's estimated that there could be more than 8,000 individual pieces of scroll and parchment that make up these documents. But we don't even know where they all are. They've been discovered all over the world. So to form the basis for the Old Testament, those manuscripts were curated into the 39 books that we know today. So jump ahead to the year 200 BCE, and we see the Septuagint Greek manuscripts emerge. There again, some editing and curating was required by man to arrive at the final product. Next, we jump to the year 600 AD, or CE as it's now known, to the introduction of the New Testament. That's right. Stories of Jesus were passed down via word of mouth a number of years before they were actually written down. So when thinking of how accurate the actual text is, think of the telephone game that you played when you were a kid, where you whisper a secret into someone's ear, and then you pass it down a line of people, and then you start to hear how distorted the message becomes. And that's what we could have here on a very grandiose scale. So at this point, we have the completed Holy Bible. Or do we? The correct answer is we do not. We start seeing new interpretations, translations, and retranslations. In the years 90 through 95 CE, we see the Council of Hamnia, a Jewish council convened to revise the books of the canon, or the Old Testament as the Christians call it. Jump ahead to the year 360 when the Laodicea Council assembles to decide which books will be accepted, accepted as Holy Scripture. You heard that right. Shortly afterwards, in 390, we see Jerome's Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible completed, and then jump ahead again to 1384 when John Wycliffe provides the first translation of the Bible in English. During the 15th century, we see a revolution take place and the increased use of Hebrew and Latin languages, so the Bible is able to be enjoyed in its native tongue. But these, there was a hiccup in the process. With more widespread use of the original texts in the Renaissance period came the discovery of corruption within the church and discrepancies between what the churches were teaching and what the Bible actually said. I know I'm going fast here, but jump ahead once more to 1525 and we see William Tyndale complete his translation of the New Testament, which is the basis for most modern day translations. However, in 1536, Tyndale was executed on charges of heresy. Womp womp. So then for the next 80 years or so, we see a few different translations of the Bible, including the Great Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible, and the Reims Douay Bible, all of which but primarily the Bishop's Bible, would be used to compile the infamous King James Version of the Bible in 1611. Fifty-four men worked on the committee to determine what the new official word of God would be, and then it was sent off for approval by the King of England. You guessed it, King James. 
So here's where it's best to note that as far as content goes, here's where the morals and social practices of the day were impressed upon scripture to make it more relevant to society of those days. Finally, in 1855, the Apocrypha were removed from the Bible, leaving us with the Old and New Testaments, or the Bible as we know it today. Fun fact, the Apocrypha is 14 chapters that were removed because they were decided that they were not the true word of God, which gives way to updated translations such as the English Revised Version and then the American Standard Version. So there you have it. That's how the Bible got to where it is today. Do you still think it's the infallible word of God? If it was, maybe Christians wouldn't have such a hard time trying to get it right. So given the, the mountain of evidence that the Bible started with stories humans made up, add to it the fact that it's been distorted throughout history based on beliefs coming from some time period. You know, how can anyone take it seriously, let alone as the infallible word of God? And the best part about all this is, all the dates and data that I just provided did not come from an atheist. These all came from church records themselves. Even though there's some history in the Bible, even the church admits that they themselves modified it. So even though they know the Bible's man-made, and remade, and remade, to the point of showing no literary consistency, but yet we still suspend our belief and force ourselves into believing that it's the literal word of God. Hopefully, if you're a Christian, you're still watching at this point, because I want to know, are you an atheist yet? If not, that's okay. There's more, for the story of Jesus isn't even original. That's right, the writers of the Bible couldn't even come up with an original storyline. They just ripped off the Mediterranean religions of the 1,000 years before it and repackaged it as new and trendy. For example, both Buddha and Jesus fasted and then went to a fig tree as their first meal. Both were tempted by the devil when they first started their ministry. Then you have Krishna, virgin birth, both called the son of God. Him and Jesus both suffered a messy death and then resurrected. Odysseus, suffering was emphasized, and instead of disciples had a brigade of sailors. Horus, born of a virgin on the winter solstice around December 25th, whose coming was signaled by the morning star. He also walked on water, healed the sick, cured blindness, cast out demons of dudes, and then was crucified, went to hell, and then heaven after three days. That's Horus, not Jesus, mind you. Dionysus, born of a virgin on December 25th, known as the Lamb, and then hung to a tree. Addis of Phrygia, born of a virgin on December 25th, called the savior of mankind, and then slain for our salvation, also murdered for our sins. Romulus, born of a virgin, darkness filled the sky upon his death, and then Anakin Skywalker, born of a virgin. I could go on, but do you see the pattern here? Jesus wasn't even the, the original virgin birth, let alone the first historical example of a zombie. But I can't force you to believe what I want you to believe. So what's my problem with the Bible? Well, besides the blatant plagiarism, it's now 2013, and I think we need to do a little something more intellectually honest than place so much faith in things like virgin births. When the Bible causes some people to believe that the earth is 6,000 years old, that's a problem. When the Bible helps to influence laws and public policy, that's a problem. When my gay friends are ostracized over some verses in the Bible, that's definitely a problem. Again, I don't mean to be a bully, and I can't tell you how sorry I am if, you're, if I'm bursting your bubble. If nothing else, I want everyone to think about what they believe, or even better, spark a discussion. I, I mean, it's human nature to, to want to fit into a group. I mean, if you've read the Bible, you'll know that we're very sheepish. As always, I invite you to leave a comment here on the website. I've started the discussion. Now you run with it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned a lot, and I'll see you next week.